So be ready. 
you're with us this morning, church, let's step across the aisles. Make each other feel welcome. If we have newcomers, make them feel welcome, Gillian. Would you please stand to your feet and sing out with us all of creation, all the earth. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back. Call back the sinner. Wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your faith. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride. Like a bride waiting for her groom will be a church ready for you. There's 
church this morning for the first time in a while, I'm not going to say open your Bibles to Hebrews. you got to open your Bibles to the book of Luke, Luke's gospel, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. And as you open your Bibles there, I, I would ask each and every one of us in this room to join me in prayer as, as we ask God's blessing on a new study. We're studying right through the book of Luke, and uh, I'm excited for this study. Let's pray and delve right into it. Join, join me, please. Father God, we come before you today, Lord, grateful that we have a place to go. And Lord, it's not this building. It, it's in your presence. 
Because the Bible tells us, Lord, that where two or three of us are gathered in your name, you're right here in the midst. And we know you're here today, not because we feel you, not because we see you, but because you've told us. And so, Lord, may we, as we open up your word, may your spirit enlighten us, reprove us, correct us, convict us. And, Lord, may your life be formed in us more perfectly because of the time we spent together in your word. And Father, we, we ask that you would heal broken hearts today, that you would comfort those that are floundering, and Lord, give grace to those that are ensnared by and trapped by sin. And set us free to worship you, we pray in Jesus' name. If you pray with me, church, today, say amen. As, as I've just shared with you, we're beginning a new study, the book of Luke, so please turn to Luke, the first uh, chapter. And I've entitled this, this, of course, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke, but I've entitled this study, All Lives Matter. All lives matter. You say, well, what do you mean all lives matter? Well, according to humans, all lives matter until one of them cut you off. And uh, when you're driving down the road, or they matter until they frustrate you or, or do something that you don't like, and then all of a sudden their life, is their life has no value whatsoever to you, but... All lives matter because Jesus Christ died for everybody. That's what puts value to all people's lives. The key verse for this study is found in Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 10. And you're going to have this memorized uh, as, as we go through. For the Son of Man, notice it's called Son of Man instead of Jesus, not called Son of God here, but Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. In the different Gospels, Matthew presents Jesus Christ of course, Matthew was mainly the gospel written to the Jews, presents him as the king, uh, the coming king. Um, Mark presents Jesus Christ as the servant. I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for all. Mark presents Christ as, as the servant leader. Uh, John's gospel presents Jesus Christ as the very son of God. John's gospel gives, uh, and, then, and I'm sorry, Luke's gospel then gives us the man side. Jesus Christ had to be 100% God and 100% man at the same time. The fancy theological name for that, you ready? If you want to try to write this down, it's the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. How many of you, be honest today, I've never heard that word before, hypostatic union, that phrase. It's, it's like oil and water. You can put oil and water in the same container, but they're not going to cross over. They're going to separate because they have different entities. And so Jesus Christ was 100% God, 100% man. They did not mix together. They were too complete. Uh, he, he, was, he was all man, but he was at the same time all God. You'd say, I don't quite understand that. Well, you're with me then. Only God could do that. But Luke presents him as man because the sacrifice for our sin had to come in like form. We sinned as men, and so the sacrifice had to be in the form of man. The introduction, let's look at this. Luke begins by revealing all the preparations taken for the arrival of a son. This son of man is not going to come from here. He's going to come from heaven. And so there's a lot of preparations for that. Just think, if you will, with me. Just ponder this for a second. You're going about your busy, get home from work, your family's sitting down to dinner, your doorbell rings, and you're like, ah, what is it? You know, somebody's selling M&Ms. And you go to your door, and you peek out. You don't just open the door. If you do, don't do that. Look first. You look out the door, and there's two very serious-looking guys in black suits, they got the ear thing and the ear going down in their suit. They got the sunglasses on, and you're thinking, do they think I'm an alien here? You know, the men in black have showed up at your doorstep. Only you know that you're not an alien, and you say through the door, because they're kind of scary, can I help you? And they say, they know your name. They know all of your name. They know your middle name. Uh, Thomas Rich Downs, we are here from the Secret Service, and we need to talk to you. 
And immediately you start thinking, okay, Secret Service, that's kind of scary, but I'm glad they didn't say IRS. <laughs> so you're scared, but you're not too scared. And so you open the door to them, and you're like, Oh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, we'd like to sit on and talk to you and your wife. And then they name your wife's three names, too. And you're like, they've been doing a little homework. They know exactly where they are. And they explain in their visit that the President of the United States of America would like to come and spend a week with your family. Us? Yes, and he's planning to come in two months. Two months' time. And they leave, and you look at your, you look at your spouse, and of course... You say, we don't have to do anything. The president's coming. You know better than that, right? You know that trim you've been meaning to paint for a couple of years? That trim's getting painted. Okay? You know those bushes that look kind of shabby outside, and you've been like, yeah, well, maybe I'll get some new bushes. You're going to get some new bushes. Okay? You're going to go to all this detail. You might even buy new china because the president's coming to your house. And he's going to be a guest in your house for a week. The normal would not fit anymore. Why? Because it's a special guest. Special guest. There are sometimes when people come, you know, family and stuff, they come and visit our house and we do it, you know, we do the thorough cleansing and all that. And, and we, we kind of went through it last summer because both of our daughters got married in the same summer, 13 weeks apart. I played golf twice last summer. Why? I was painting, I was doing this, I was, doing, I was window washing, my wife was doing... Th why? Because people were going to come stay at our house and what we get used to was not good enough for guests. Okay? Well, the world's going to get a special guest. The Son of God, the Son of Man, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. He has existed forever. You say, well, how long is that? My brain doesn't compute that, but it's, it's time without a beginning and time without an end. He lives outside of time. It's, it, I mean, to even conceive of who Jesus Christ is just boggles our petty little minds, but he's coming to the earth, and heaven is making preparations for it. They're the ones that are in charge of preparing the way. And so we see in Luke's gospel, first of all, the purpose for Luke writing the gospel. Now, let's talk about Luke for a minute. Who's Luke? Well, first of all, he's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. And he's a, the reason we call him the good doctor, Luke, is because he actually was a physician, a medical doctor. He was a medical doctor. And the thing I love about Luke is we know he wrote this. He, he wrote uh, much, if not all, of the book of Acts. Uh, the, the early church, but he was a detail guy because that's what doctors do. I, I don't, you know, go to the doctor and say, were you, you know, I'm looking for a doctor that got D's in med school to do my surgery. I mean, he passed. He didn't, he wasn't top of his class, but he got through. And that's who I want to do my surgery. And I, I don't go to the doctor and say, now listen, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to cut you open because I like cutting, and we're just going to see if there's anything wrong in there. And if not, hey, good news, we'll sew you back up, you're good to go. No, 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 no. We need to know. Before you go cutting, we need to know. And I want the A-plus guy cutting me. How about you? I want the A-plus person. And uh, so I do a little investigation when I, when I go to the doctor. I'm just not like, yeah, well... You know, whatever you say, Doc, I'm like, oh, no. And especially if they contradict themselves from one visit to the next, you're like, the last visit you said that, oh, did I? I'm sorry, I'm overworked. You're overworked? Well, maybe, you, maybe I need to find a doctor that can squeeze me in. You know? And Luke was one of these guys. He was a detail guy. And so here he gives us his purpose for writing. In the first four verses, chapter 1, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, the early church, such as the original eyewitnesses, the ones who saw Jesus, the one who saw the empty tomb, and the servants of the word handed them down to us. But it also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first 
to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theopolis, so that you also may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. We live in a day and age that says, oh, this Christianity thing, it's just a man, it's just a man concocted story so that people, you know, so that those people can just feel like they're different. No, it's actually not a man concocted story at all. It's a God given story for everybody on the planet. And that's why Luke said, man, I have written down in excruciating detail the eyewitness accounts so that we know what we believe in. He said to, what he's saying right here is he's he's writing this, his purpose is to compile a complete history of the events surrounding the beginnings, the growth, and the development of Christianity. He wants us to know, it said in verse 4, so that you may know Theopolis and us, so that we may know what we have been instructed. The Greek word, therefore, is katecheo. It means so that we can be, so we can be catechized or we can experience catechism. It's the orderly teaching of the study of God, the theology of what we believe. Because our faith rests upon the unshakable historical facts within God's word. If God's word, just like a doctor, if God's word got it wrong anywhere, why would you believe the rest of the story? If they said, hey, there was a city here, and they dig, and there's there's no city here. But you know what? It's it's amazing that archaeology keeps catching up with the Bible. This is why I'm a Christian and not an evolutionist. Because I went to public school right when they were switching from creation to evolution. Okay? And so I was blown away when I walked into junior high school in Allen Park, first, first science class, seventh grade, and my teacher was a full-blown Darwinian evolutionist. And he told me and the rest of the class, we came from the monkeys. Not, hey, hey, we're the monkeys. Not those monkeys. Because I was like, man, I would love to be Davy Jones. I mean, who would not want to be Davy Jones? Some of you are like, who's Davy Jones? You have to Google it. (laughs) Because Davy Jones was cool when I was a kid. Man, can I get an amen? And he was like that big, too. But he was still cool. And uh, so they said, this this teacher, I mean, he straight-faced, we came from the monkeys. I was like, really? And here's the proof. Because we found the missing links between, you know, the real hairy Guys swinging in the trees, and us, the upright walkers, okay? And and the the missing links are, ready? Big words. Zenzanthropus and Australopithecus. See, they they name them these big words to make it sound so educated. Australopithecus. Zenzanthropus. Must be true. And then they found out that it was a hoax. That this guy digging in the dirt had found a bone chip about a quarter of an inch, and he built a man out of it and said, this is what he looked like. I don't think so. And this is why I don't believe evolution. They change their story over and over and over and over again. Why? Well, they keep finding things that disturb their story, so they have to change it. That's why I'm not a Jehovah Witness. They keep changing the story. That's why I'm not a Mormon. They keep changing the story. Okay? Christianity, same story, whole time. Never been proven wrong. I'm not evolutionist because why? They don't have the facts. Here's the good news about that teacher. In ninth grade, I came to Baptist Park, and one of my classes was creation science. And I went back to visit my science teacher in Allen Park. And I started telling him the truth. And by the end of my ninth grade year, I got to lead that man to Jesus Christ. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Yes, it does. It does happen. It does happen. Because why? He could not deny the truth. And we just don't give our kids enough truth. 
to fight the battle because it's all in the good book. Okay, and so Luke wants us to know the truth. He wants us to be catechized. I mean, he wants us to know line by line we can trust in what we believe about Jesus Christ because I've heard it from the eyewitness accounts, and I've compiled it for you. Now he goes right into it in verse 5. After he says, this is why I wrote, he get, jumps right into it, just like a doctor. There's no like, oh, man, I know this and that. No personal stuff. He's like, let's get to the facts. Okay? Right at Dragnet. Just the facts, man. Verse 5. In the days, and this is silence broken, in the days of King Herod, that's Herod the Great of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. Look at the detail. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. He's given us bloodline. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive. And both of them were well along in the years. Verse 11. And the angel of the Lord, it was Gabriel, appeared to them. Stand at the right side of the altar and answer. So Zachariah is what? He's going in to Jerusalem for his two-week. They would All the priests would show up for the Passover and, and the three main uh, feasts and, uh, and, and celebrations during the year. But the rest of the year, they would go in two-week shifts. And so here's Zechariah in town, in Jerusalem, for his two-week shift at what is known as what? The New Temple or Herod's Temple. It's not Solomon's because, remember, it was destroyed. And this was the rebuilt one that Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, that they rebuilt and this is where he's serving. And he's there doing his two-week stint. And he's privileged to be, so he was high up on the chain. He was the one taking the incense into the inner sanctum of the temple. And the altar of incense is right there before the curtain of the holiest of holies. And the incense is a picture of what? It's a picture of our prayers and the prayers of Israel going up before the Lord. The smoke of the prayers going up into the presence of God. That's why they put the altar of incense right against the curtain so that the incense smoke would go into the holies of holies, into the presence of God, into the, where the mercy seat was and all that, so God would meet their needs. And so he's going in there, taking that special mixture of incense and putting it in there so that the smoke of that is filling the holies of holies. And that's where he's doing, he's doing that, and the angel appears to him. When Zachariah saw him, he was startled, and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. Now, verse 17, let's read on. And he will go before him. Speaking of John, is going to go before him in the, it, of, of the Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous, to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. How can I know this, Zechariah asked the angel, for I am an old man, and my wife is well along in the years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. So right now we know underneath Zachariah's Jewishness, he's really a Baptist at heart. I say, why is that? Because an angel that stands in the presence of God was sent to give him a message, and he was like, I don't know. A yeah, true Baptist. I mean, this, you can't even say he's from Missouri, because he's seeing it. You can't even say, show me. Gabriel's showing him. I mean, he showed up. But why? Well, we, you know, we... We tend to look at our circumstances and our feelings and notice what he's saying. Well, my wife's old. I'm old. I mean, how's this going to work? Well, let's look at what's really going on here. God has finally broken 400 years of silence. God hasn't given a vision, a word of prophecy. He hasn't given a dream. He hasn't given anything to his nation for 400 years since Malachi's prophecy. And what has happened during those 400 years? Well, the Pharisees have come to, come to rise. There were no Pharisees in Malachi's day, but now they're the controlling 
religious people. And then you got them battling the Sadducees that don't even believe in the resurrection. And these are the guys in charge of the religious system. And you got Rome in charge of the political system. Israel is an unmitigated mess. Because as, if you go back to the last prophecy of God, Malachi, God told them what the problem was. He said, you don't want me. You just want what I can do for you. I'm tired of your sacrifice. I'm tired of you robbing me. You want to live life your own way? Go ahead. And their life is a disaster. And God finally shows up and breaks 400 years of silence with the good news. I'm here to tell you God's going to answer your prayer. He's going to answer your prayer. And what does he tell him he's going to answer his prayer with? Well, he gives him news of a son named John. You're going to name him John. And he's going to pray, prepare the way for the Messiah. That's what everybody in Israel always has prayed about. Lord, come. Lord, come. Lord, come. Lord, come. Bring the Messiah, the sent one. And he said, it's going to happen. John doubts him. I'm sorry, Zechariah doubts him. Let's verse 20. Now listen, and you will become silent, the Gabriel continues, and unable to speak until the days these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. Some were probably wondering, I wonder if he crossed over in the holies of holies and he's toast. What if he fell? And when he did not, when, when he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. And when they realized that he had seen a vision of the sanctuary, he kept making signs to them and remained speechless. What was he doing? He came out, couldn't talk. He was trying to do charades. Seen an angel. I fell over. I was scared. He came up. He said, Elizabeth is going to have a child. And he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. And they're looking at him going, well, he's seen something. Because he's looking crazy. I mean, and they're like, wow, man, you were in there a long time. I mean, you could imagine how frustrating it was to try to explain to them, God broke his silence. And now I can't speak. That's kind of funny right there. Okay. Let's look at verse 24. Can we trust God's word? Then after these days, after his two weeks, his wife Elizabeth conceived, bam, and kept herself in seclusion for five months. Does God know what he's talking about? Yeah, he does. The point in these verses, though, is that Zechariah was given a sign, but then he was given punishment for not believing. Let me ask you something. When we don't believe God's word in our, in our own personal lives, in our marriage, with our families, in our work life, tell me that doesn't silence our witness. We don't believe it to be true. It silences our witness. The things that we know to be true about God, if we don't put them into practice, what if it just... And you look at the church today in America, and you say, oh, we're on TV, we're on, we got Christian radio. Man, I mean, Christian radio is the coolest radio to listen to. And it, we got all this, we got 4,500 people list, listen to our podcast, watching our podcast every month. That's what Google says. Is America becoming Christian? No. Why? I don't think that the church really believes what God says in the book. I think we're like Zacharias. Well, can God change America? I don't know. Okay. He can't change my family. He can't change my marriage. He can't, change. he can't fix a sin problem in my life. He can, he can't. Well, the book says he can. Do we believe it? Or have we been silenced because of our disbelief? Hmm. Look at the next point. Because God is a possible God, we can believe him. And this is the whole point that Luke writes. Gabriel then visits 
a little teenage girl. She's poor, but she's got the right family tree. Her name's Mary. And so Gabriel visits a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph, the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Notice, virgin, virgin, virgin. They want us to understand. She's a virgin. Verse 31. Now listen, Gabriel says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus, the one that saves. Verse 34, Mary asked the angel, she, she said, okay, I'll do it, but got a question here. How can this be, since I have not been intimate with a man? And the angel replied to her, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born, not created within you, but to be born, will be called the Son of God. Look in verse 37, though. For nothing will be impossible with God. Well, what's the, what's the impossible thing here? Well, we have a physical impossibility, and we have a spiritual impossibility. What's the physical impossibility? That a woman could give birth to a child without the egg and the sperm meeting. It's impossible. Those two things create a one-celled animal a one-cell creature, and that cell multiplies and multiplies and multiplies, and then what? Baby. Okay? You need his DNA, her DNA. You need those things to combine for a child to be born. It is impossible to make a child without those things. It's physically impossible. But with God, it's not an impossibility because he didn't take her stuff and Joseph's stuff. Jesus wasn't a created being. He already existed. He just humbled himself and became the form of a one-celled human being. That's how far he lowered himself. He was implanted in her by the Holy Spirit as a one cell and it immediately began multiplying it wasn't hers it wasn't because if it was any of her equipment and joseph's the curse would have been transferred to jesus what curse the sin curse remember what david said in the psalms i was conceived in sin our children don't learn sin from the environment they were conceived when that those two things met that one-celled little child within your womb was a immediate sinner. Immediate. Why? The curse. It's passed through the blood. That's why Jesus could not have those bloodlines in him. In him. So he picked this teenage girl. He says, you're going to give birth. Nothing's impossible. There, the, I can't stress how important the virgin birth is. I can't stress it. It's the fulfillment of the oldest prophecies in Scripture. Genesis 3.15 says, when Satan was, when uh, the Lord was talking to Adam and Eve, he said, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between Satan and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head. The woman's seed will strike your head, and you will strike his heel, speaking of the crucifixion of the Messiah. Isaiah 7.14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Well, what's the sign? The virgin will conceive. It's impossible. You can't have those in the same sentence. Virgin and conception. The virgin will experience the impossible. And she will be with child. Okay? And have a son. And here's what you're going to call him. Emmanuel. God is with us. God is with us. If Mary's not a virgin... Our faith is useless. But the good Dr. Luke is saying, man, it's a surety. It's a surety. This is what God did to save us. Now, that's the physical impossibility. What's the spiritual impossibility? The spiritual impossibility for any of us to fix our sin problem. Can you do it? I can't do it. I can't even quit eating Cheez-Its. Actually, I've been pretty good with the Cheez-Its. It's been Frito-Lay chips lately. Okay? 
It was the family event that put me over the edge. I'm going to blame the church event. I know you guys don't do this with your sin. You know, what's a family event? Well, we had hot dogs and potato chips. Bags of Frito-Lay potato chips. You say, you're allowed one bag. Who stops at one bag? <laughs> That's the question. Who stops at one? I was driving down the road last night, and we're sitting at the light, my wife and I. She loves me dearly. She looks up to the side, look it. Frito-Lay, buy one, get one free. Like, I'm questioning your love for me right now. You want me to pull in? She goes, no, you know you. I said, then why would you point it out to me? We had a little family moment. This is a little one. Okay. I can't unsend myself. I can't go back and give back the candy bar I stole when I was a kid. You can't go back and, and pay respect to the teacher that you disrespected. You can't go back and tell the truth to your parent that you lied to. You can't go back and unsin your life. You can't. It's an impossibility. But God's going to send a Savior. And he's going to save us. He's going to make the impossible possible through what he does on the cross. Amen? Amen. Now, let's look at the prophetic knowledge. So then Gabriel, he's been busy. Gabriel, you know, tells Mary about it, and, and Elizabeth is with child. And, and so verse 41 now, Mary goes, they're cousins, her and Elizabeth, so she goes to see Elizabeth. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Mary came in the house, the baby within Elizabeth, John, leaped inside her. Even though we call him John the Baptist, he was, he was a rare Baptist. He was actually, he jumped. He was like, yeah, John the Baptist Pentecostal. Okay. And Elizabeth was then, this is special, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we take this for granted. We studied this in Hebrews. We have that problem. But they operated with just their intellect and their mind and their emotion. But she was filled specifically because she's giving birth to the one that's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And she's given special knowledge here with the Spirit. Verse 45, she who has uh, believed is blessed, uh, Elizabeth tells Mary, because what was spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled. She was filled with the Holy Spirit, and as she was filled with the Holy Spirit, she prays and thanks God. It's called Mary's Magnificent in the following verses. Praise and thanksgiving to God from those that are filled with the Holy Spirit. We spend too much time looking at man. That's why our life is not filled with praise and thanksgiving, because we're like, oh, yeah. And I, even today, I came in, and, and first guy I talked to at church today, I was like, how you doing? Oh, man, I can't even make it through the paper anymore. I said, oh, yeah? I should have just left it there. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, you know. They want to bring... 10,000 of these Syrian refugees to America. There's going to be some jihadists in there. And then Karen's getting up and he's saying he wants it to be 70,000. And you look at that face value and you're like, why are we bringing our enemies to here? You just look at a face value and you're like, that's really silly. But if you really believe, you notice what she said? She believed what God said. They were blessed because we believe. But when you look at that news through the lens of Scripture, here's what you say. Ah. No, you say, Jesus is coming. I mean, he's coming soon. Because the world has gone crazy. See? And it can make you excited. But see, we don't believe this. We believe what we hear in the news. We don't see it through the lens of Scripture. So these girls, are, Elizabeth and Mary, have both got news that through the human eyes is crazy, but through the lens of Scripture, through the lens of heaven, it's like, oh, this is awesome. This is awesome that everybody thinks in town thinks I'm a tramp, and I won't admit it. And I'm blaming God for my trampiness. Say, so who are you talking about? Mary! The people didn't say, 
oh, Mary, oh, yeah, you saw an angel. Oh, yeah, and it wasn't Joseph. No, what, Joseph? I know you guys would never. Oh, my gosh, do you hear her? She's blaming God. Just admit it, girlfriend. Okay, we've all been there. You know, it just went a little too far, and hey, it's all right. You guys get married, it'll be okay. Go to your cousin's house, it's, it's fine. Just don't blame God. She's like, no, really. Joseph and I, we haven't been together. Ask him, he's really upset about it. And, and I'm just, and it's growing, and we haven't. And Right. Yeah. Like she wanted that in her day. But what did she say? I believe you. Be it unto me as you have spoken. And what does Scripture say about Mary? She was highly favored by God among all the women. God was like, I like her. Hmm. Now let's look next at John's birth. Bump up to... Verse 57, so she's at Elizabeth's house, and Elizabeth finally, the day comes, and she gives birth to John, okay? And John's name means Jehovah is gracious. The God that made us is a gracious God. That's what his name means. God is gracious to us. Can I get an amen? Well, if you're Zachariah, you're like, See, that's what Zechariah did. He didn't say anything. And you're like, was he thinking God is gracious? Let's find out. So he gives birth, and everybody in the room, they're like, oh. And he's not, he's not speaking. What are you going to name him, Mary? I mean, Elizabeth, what are you going to name him? You're going to name him Zechariah, right? You're going to name him after your husband. Because, I mean, his firstborn son, it's a special gift. They're old age. Yeah, you're going to put, put your name on him, right? And he's like, mm, 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 mm. And, they give, and they've been very accustomed. They give him his writing slate because, man, this, that's his new buddy. Verse 63, 64. So he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, His name is John. And they were all amazed. Why? Because he didn't put his name on it. Because they weren't in when he was given in. They didn't hear what Gabriel said, and he couldn't tell them what Gabriel said, but boy... He's had nine months to think about it. And what looked like God being mean to him was really a blessing him, and it turned his heart back to the truth about the Messiah. And I think John's been looking at the, I'm sorry, Zachariah's been looking at the Scripture and seeing all the truth, and it's coming alive before his eyes, and he's excited now. And he's like, no, no, we're calling him John. Because that's what the angel said, man. I'm in. I'm in now. See, there's a lot of Christians, man. God has done this and this and this in your life. How much more proof do you need? Before you say, I'm in. I'm finally going to do it. I'm finally going to jump in both feet. Instead of playing around, man. I mean, I'm going full bore on this Christian thing. Crazy stuff. And so immediately... His mouth was opened, and his tongue was set free, and he began to speak, praising God. See, obedience, I've, I've said this, and I'm going to keep saying it because it's the main truth in Scripture. Obedience brings blessing. It does. Now, a lot of people look at him and say, oh, man, that was a blessing. He couldn't speak. Oh, yeah, it was. Because it, it did a work on Zechariah. He went into the Scriptures, and he found, and he was convinced. He's like, oh, okay. This is exactly what the prophecies say. And he's looking at the family tree and saying, oh, you can't know that. Sure you can. Remember when Jesus was born a couple months later? And the wise men from the east come, and they go to Herod the Great. And they say, Herod, where's the king? He goes, I'm the king. No, no. The one that the stars are talking about. The one that the prophecies are talking about. He's here. Where is he? We, wanna, we have gifts for him. And Herod Clueless. And what did he do? He brought the scribes in, the guys that know the Old Testament. And he said, hey, these guys are telling me there's a king. 
Is there a king? And they opened up the scripture and they said, yeah, he's in Bethlehem. See? When they looked, they found him, but they didn't want to look. And what did Herod do? He promptly said, kill all the children in Bethlehem, all the boys, slaughter them. I don't want any competition. And some of the theologians estimate three to 5,000 little boys lost their life because of King Herod the Great's jealousy. Well, they found it in the book when Herod told them to. They found it. They said, oh, it's in Bethlehem. It's right there in Scripture. So Zechariah's looking at Scripture, and he's like, oh, man, this, it's happening. The Messiah's coming. <gasps> he said, oh, we're naming him John. We're doing what, oh, I'm doing what the angel said. Verse 68, here's what, here's what Zechariah, he, he starts praising the Lord and the God of Israel because he's visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Salvation from our enemies and from the clutches of those who hate us. And since we have been rescued from our enemies' clutches to serve him without fear, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. He's like, man, the greatest gift is on its way. It's here. And everybody's... <laughs> Yeah, it's here, preacher. Is it lunchtime? See? Zechariah's prophecy was filled with references to redemption and salvation. Because look at the conclusion. As we allow the Spirit of God to control us like Zechariah did, like Elizabeth did, like Mary did, we will focus upon life's greatest gift, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. The intro to the book of Luke. Now, let me take you on a little walk in closing. I got two minutes. If you go in my basement somewhere, I don't know exactly where it is, there's lots of boxes down there, actually plastic tubs. We went from boxes to plastic tubs years ago. And there's plastic tubs with lids on them, and there's a bunch of stuff down in there. And it's the same stuff you got in your stuff you don't remember. One of those containers down there, or maybe two or three of them, I think, is full of all my high school, but mainly my college trophies. All the trophies I got playing ball in college. There's a championship ring that I never wear down there. There's a watch that I wear down, that I'd never wear. It's down there. I, I, I got no use for them. Every once in a while, you know, when, when you're doing that house cleaning I was talking about, you, you're like, okay, we got to do some spring cleaning. We got to get the cobwebs. I'm embarrassed, you know. Spiders are taking over. And you go through and you clean all your stuff and then put it right back in. But as you're cleaning it, sometimes you open the lid and you're like, oh, there's my train set. <laughs> and then all the memories come flooding back. And you can smell the electricity running through those lines. Remember that, guys? When you, you'd smell that little electricity, and it was like burnt toast smelling. Okay. And you pull it out, and your kids are like, what's that? Oh, that's my train. This was cool. Or maybe you open another box, you wipe over the box, and it's her dolly. The doll that she drug around everywhere with her and slept with her and everything, and it's in a box. And that all those memories come, oh, yeah, or your favorite blankie. It has your DNA all over it. Crusty DNA. Your favorite dolly, or you open up another box, and that's that stuff you couldn't throw away, and it was you were going to use it someday, and you're like, why did we even keep this? I wonder if it works. And... You open those boxes and the fond memories come out and you're like, man, this is great. And my train set, my Hot Wheels set, my trophies. I, I really was a ball player. Because my body's going, no, you weren't. Well, the trophy proves it, it happened, but it was ancient history. It's when shorts were short. That's how long ago it was. Yeah. Shorts were like way up here. 
And you have these fond memories, and then what do you do? You clean it off, and you put it in the box, and you put it right back. And it doesn't change anything. And what does that have to do with Luke? I think what we've done with the greatest thing we've ever gotten, salvation, we've stuck it in a box in our life. We've put it in a cabinet. And we know it's there. We take it out every week sometimes. We look at it and we go, oh, yeah, thank you. And we put it back in. And then we go live like everybody else that knows nothing about the greatest gift ever given. Oh, God, forgive us. We're sticking our identity in a box, in a category, and limiting it. Instead of it being in our mind, our lips, and our heart, and our hands. Instead of it being the focal point of every single day, we've relegated it to a little cubby space in our heart. And we come to church and say, oh, you really, you really got the box out. You, you gave me the warm fuzzies. That was nice. And then by the time we hit lunch... It's back on the shelf. God didn't save us to put that greatest gift to mankind on the shelf. He saved us to put it to use in our life. He gave it to us to share it, to be changed by it, to be ruled by it, not to collect dust. I hope you'll reappreciate as we study the book of Luke, God's greatest gift. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. I was lost. It was impossible for me to do it. And He did it for me. Wow. I don't want to put that away this afternoon. I don't, want to, I don't want to drag it out next Saturday night because church is tomorrow. I want to put it to use this week. How about you? With heads bowed and eyes closed right where you sat. Now the Christians here say, yeah, I'm a believer, Pastor. I, I know I'm a believer, but I, I'm not making use of my relationship with Christ. It's relegated. I put it in a category of my life. It's, it doesn't rule me. Not even close. I want to ask God for forgiveness today. I want to renew my first love. There's something about being honest with the one that loves us, how that just cleanses the air. If that's your, right before we pray, if that's your decision today with heads bowed, would you slip your hand up and say, include me in that prayer, Pastor? Hands all over. How about this, church? Is there anyone here today who would, who would say, Pastor, you're talking about this relationship. I know about, I believe in the existence of God. I believe in Jesus. But the, you, you, this personal thing, I don't have that. I know about him, but he doesn't live within me. I want that. I want that. Listen, it, the Bible says if you want that, all you have to do is ask him for it. He doesn't force himself on anybody, but he gives himself to anyone that asks. So right now, if you would just ask Jesus in your life to forgive your sins, to be your Savior, to make you a new person, he will do all of that because that's what he came to save. He came to save people like me and you that have messed up and realize we can't do it ourselves. We can't fix it. But if you would like to trust Jesus right where you sit today and you would like me to pray for you, the prayer does nothing. Your heart condition does everything. If that's what your heart desires today, would you slip your hand up right before we pray? And say, Pastor, pray for me. I've never done it before. But today's the day. I want to do it today. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. You don't have to keep your hand up. Yes, awesome up there. Great choice. Great choice. Let's all stand to our feet. 
And if you can, if you're physically able, just lift your hands up to heaven as if to receive something from the Lord. Father God, first of all, we pray for those, Lord, that, that have physically moved and, and said, we, we need you, Jesus. And I got to believe that you're already doing a work in their heart and mind, but I just pray, Lord, that they would ask you for forgiveness of their sin. They would repent. They would turn from it and run to you. I just pray, Lord, that they would invite you into their life to, to save them, to be their Lord, their master, and, and Lord, bless them with the, the gift of eternal life. And Lord, for those of us that know you, but we stuck that gift into a box in our life, I just pray, Lord, you would forgive us. Renew us today. Make your mercies and grace new because you're a gracious, merciful God. Lord, we want to live for you. We want to please you. And we want to appreciate what you've done for us. And so, Lord, have your way in our life. This week we pray in Jesus' name. Church, thank you for praying. Let's sing together that we want to worship the Lord. Thank you.